when John asked me to uh, pick two scriptures um, for tonight, I spent a bit of time with the Lord, was that different ideas coming through my head? But those are the two that he gave me. Because when you read the Bible, right through from the very beginning, literally, you find disease and, and pain and suffering. Particularly a lot of things like leprosy. And leprosy was a thing that was looked upon as the, the worst possible thing to happen in those days. If you had leprosy, you were an outcast, you were unlovable, you were unwantable, you were untouchable. Today we don't have leprosy as such. But we do have drug addicts, and we do have mental health patients, and we do have ex-prisoners, and we do have homeless people. And really, they are treated pretty much the same way as what lepers were in Jesus' day. We'll look at them and we'll think, oh, thank goodness that's not me. You'll look at them and you'll think, well, why is he here? Why does he do something about himself? Particularly some of the mental health people, it's sad. And the drug addicts. We had a, 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 a father and son who were heavy mainline drug users. And we took them in and we put them into a room together so they couldn't be separated. And we had to teach them so many basics of what's play because they'd forgotten them. And even how to communicate with people. Because people in the community had shunned them so much. You know, they were spat on and they were throwing things at. One, one, at one stage there, the father was shot with a slug gun, just walking down the street. They're easy targets. If you look at Jeremy, who walks around town, towing a, a, a trolley with his whole belongings in. And everyone thinks, oh, and he does need a shower. He comes to our office once a week, where's our agents? We look after his money. He can't put him in a bed. He won't sleep in a bed. He doesn't want to be inside the house. But he comes to us and we bought him, take him down to one of the houses and make him have a shower and change his clothes and we give him his money and, and give him a cup of coffee. And he was saying to us, it's not very often someone will even talk to him nicely. He gets a lot of people giving him a hard time and keep calling him names. Jeremy is not a drug addict. Jeremy has a mental health problem. But he's classed in that same group of people. And they're all treated differently. How would you feel if your granddaughter came home and says, Grandma, Granddad, I've just been expelled from school for selling drugs. How would you feel? You didn't even know she used drugs, and here she has been suspended permanently for selling drugs at school. How do you handle that? Do you kick her out? Do you throw her away? Of course you don't. You love her through it. You do the very best you can. But what happens to the people who don't have grandparents or parents or any support network? What happens when they come out of prison and they look for some loving, someone to treat them as an equal? Where do they go? You know, the only place they can find really so many times it's the same place they came from. They go back to the same sewer that they were brought, brought up on. They go back to the same group of friends and they end up in the same place. There was a 14 year old girl um, picked up in Los Angeles a few years ago. She was a 14-year-old prostitute on heroin. And she was interviewed by Time Life a year or so afterwards, and, she, and they asked her, 
How could she live in a sewer? And this was her answer. Uh, but when you're on heroin, you feel so good. You can live anywhere, even in a sewer, and be happy. Now you see, you get a young person who has been mistreated, abused, told that they're no good, they're useless, they're nothing. And they feel bad about themselves all their lives. And suddenly they come across a drug that makes them feel good. And feel good about themselves. Why would they not use it? Why would they not start smoking methamphetamine where for 16 hours sometimes they can feel like they're on top of the world? They can feel absolutely fantastic. And for sometimes these young ones, it's the first time they've ever felt good about themselves in years. How hard it is for us to say don't use it. So they're not going to listen to us. So that's how we as an organisation, Farmers um, North Street Band and North Broadway Brother, got formed 17 years ago. Nobody was doing a thing for these people. Nobody was doing anything for their parents and their supporters. So we started, and we started in a very small way. We had a local firm actually supply the money for our first band. It was an amazing, amazing miracle of God. We, called, we decided we were going to do, go into this operation and start this organisation. And we started our first training. We had no van, we had no money, but we just really believed God was in it. And our training finished three weeks before Christmas. We had 45 people trained to go out of the van and no van. But we believed that the Lord wanted us to do it. The van was on the road on the first weekend in February the following year. <laughs> that local firm gave it to us. Uh, a retired uh, sign writer painted it up for us and we were out on the road. Right from the start, God was in this whole world thing. And, and we just decided it was, it was going to happen. We were going to take Christian love out to the people on the street. And at first they didn't believe us and they thought we're just going to be another Christian group that's going to come and go. But as the years went along, we, we started to stay and we started getting credibility with the people on the street. We keep a record of the people that come into our office in King Street now. We had 119 people come and see us this week alone. Some of the people might be because we're their agent for their money. Sometimes it's just for a cup of coffee or a pie. Sometimes it's just for a chance to talk. And sometimes you walk in that office, there's no, there's no one to sit. It's just, it's, People walk in and say, whoa. But you see, they feel that they can come and they, they can accept us. And when they come in, they know we're Christians. On the end of my desk is a big silver cross. And there's a serenity prayer. Footprints, Jesus' footprints up on the wall. We don't like the fact we're Christians. Because what we're doing. <coughs> It's a very simple thing. We're representing Christ to them. We're representing Christ to these people that are have no family. There's one lady in town who's been a mental health patient probably all her life. She texts me three or four times a day just to make sure I'm okay. Well, I text her back and say, yes, we're good. She'll come into town once a week and she'll always come to for a cup of coffee and fix the vacuum cleaner up and vacuums around and does bits and pieces. But I always take time to text her back. Because if I don't text her back, who will? 
I know people complain about her texting them all the time. But do you know what it does to her when she gets a text? When that lady gets a text from somebody else, she sometimes cries. I've seen it happen. Because someone has taken the time to text her. These people we say are drug addicts and uh, riffraff, etc. Uh, are sometimes the most unlovable people on earth. But one of the things I drum into all our volunteers at the training and whenever they come into me and complain, I say this. No matter what you might think, no matter what you will say, I'm not going to stop talking to them and ministering to them and caring about them. Because Jesus died for them. You know that? Jesus actually died for them. And if he can do that for them, surely we can give them a cup of coffee and something to talk to. At any rate, the problem that this, this what happened next was probably one of the things we really, really, truly got told off for. We had a situation where we had one van and we couldn't take the people home. And this girl, 18 year old girl, came to the van one night and says, Look, you people to live home. Uh, my boyfriend and me had had an argument, etc. And we couldn't because we had six people in the van and there was no spare seats. So we said, We're sorry, but we get your taxi. She said, No, and she walked. That girl was raped on that night. We had a committee meeting the following Tuesday and we said, Never, ever, ever happen again. And we went out, and within two weeks, we had a second van on the van on the road. And that van still cruises the streets today. In fact, there's now two of them. There's three vans out on the Saturday night. We go out there, and we pick up particularly women and take them home. But sometimes young ones, quite often young ones. And people criticise us for doing that. And they say, well, you just can use a taxi, you just make it easy for them, with all these things that we do wrong. But my answer to them is this. How many women do we have to get home safely and not be raped? Makes it worthwhile. I've got an answer for those people. One. One. If we have managed to get one woman home safely without being raped, it is worth it. It could have been your granddaughter. It is worth it. And you can criticise us for doing that as much as you like, but I will fight to keep it. Because we have, I could tell you for hours, stories about the people we have picked up and taken home. We've even had letters from people in Canada thanking us for picking, picking up their daughters and we'll carry on doing that. About nine years ago, about nine years ago, might be longer, that's me, possibly ten years ago, we had a situation where one of the old lodges in town was closed and we had three guys who were our clients came to our office in Princess Street in tears because they had nowhere to go. Rebecca Lodge had closed down. So we got, we got together and we formed an organisation called Shepherd's Rest Trust and we, we rented that building and we had up, we started off, we, we worked it out that we could, as long as we had 20 people there we, we could break even. Well by Christmas that year we had 50 and by late February the following year we had 63 people staying there. It became an earthquake risk and the landlord would not fix it so we had to get out of there. And today we have six different residents around Palmerston North and we have 58 people maximum staying with us. Uh, last night we had one person sleeping on a couch and one person sleeping in a storeroom because we've nowhere else to put them. We're looking for some of that at some other houses at the moment. Those people who stay with us would be either drug addicts or mental health patients and a lot of people coming out of prison. They have nowhere else to go, believe me. 
with a point of last resort. They have nowhere else to go. And I would not ask you to take them into your houses. It's the last thing I'd ask you to do. Because that would put you at risk. But we do need somewhere in Palmerston North where we can carry on doing this. I was at the local government um, conference in Queenstown last, just a few last couple months ago, and the deputy mayor from Auckland had heard about the work that we do in the city. She is coming down just to go out and see how we do it, because she wants to take what we do back to Auckland. I've had the, the ex-mayor from Wellington come up and have a look, but it's a too hard basket, you see. And I know that the Deputy Mayor from Auckland will come down and they'll go back and the idea is great and they'll talk about it another time. <laughs> because you see, their motivation is wrong. They're doing it because they want to do it or because someone's getting the funding and everything else. We did it without the funding. We did it because Jesus wanted us to do it. And if they wanted to do it happen in Auckland, I've already told them this, get the churches together like we did. When we first started, we had 16 different churches involved with us. Now we've got 30. We went around all the churches and we asked for help. It was a Christian-based operation. And we, when we set up, we had local lawyers that set up our constitution, and we'd seen so many organisations who were Christians that aren't Christians anymore because non-Christians had taken them over and changed them. So we decided we were going to be a Christian organisation and we wanted to make sure it always stayed a Christian organisation. So we got our, our lawyer to put something in, in, in our constitution to make sure we stay Christian. And this is it, that one clause. And it's accepted by the Charities Commission, it's accepted by everybody. And this is the one clause that states that we'll always be Christians. It says this, to be a member or a volunteer in Palmerston North Street Band Incorporated, you must accept the five absolutes. These are the five absolutes. One, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Two, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Three, Jesus Christ is part of the Trinity and we accept the Trinity in its entirety. Four, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Five, the Bible is the only inspired word of God. They are our five absolutes. If you can't accept those five things, you can't be one of our volunteers. You can't be on our committee. You can't be on our executive. It's our culture. That is our culture. It's a Christian culture. We're a Christian organisation and we don't hide that fact. Anyone who knows our organisation knows that we stick to that. And yes, we have tracks on the bands. And yes, we'll talk to you about Jesus if you give us half an opening. We don't Bible bash, not allowed to do that. But if you come up to me and say, why do you do this? Well, you ask me, haven't you? That's what I've got a right to tell you. We are a Christian organisation representing Christ, the unlovable, the unlovely and the uncared. And I pray to God that we'll always carry on doing it. But you know the most amazing thing is, our lady walked into my office with my wife actually yesterday, with a young baby in her arms. I've known her since probably 2000, year 2000. When she came to us, she was a gang member and she was one of Today she's one of the most lovely Christian women you could ever, ever meet. She asked Jesus into her life and she's changed her life. We've got people who have come to the Lord through our ministry who are Sunday school teachers. We've got one in uh, the Bible College up in Calamar.
lifestyle. That's the best way to cure their leprosy, if you like. Because there is a cure, you see, to their drug addiction. There is a cure. It's not a pill. It's a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. That's what we do. And that's the answer to the drug problems we have in our community.